paraphrasing Jos Merlu, a Dutch psychiatrist, best-selling 1956 book, The Rape of the Mind. It is now technically possible to bring the human mind into a condition of enslavement and submission. The modern advancements in mass communication ensure that every home is exposed to the global sphere on a daily basis. Concurrently, propaganda strategies have been honed and systematized, leaving few avenues to evade the constant onslaught of visual and verbal assaults on the mind. The pressures of daily life increasingly push individuals towards seeking an escape from responsibility and maturity. It's evident that resisting these pressures poses difficulty for many, the appeal of a political fix is highly tempting, while others find refuge in substances like alcohol or drugs, or pursue alternative artificial pleasures. Individuals in our shared world must not only identify and combat this covert assault on mental integrity, but also understand the internal factors within the human psyche that render them susceptible to such attacks. The totalitarian jailkeepers deliberately stay silent on matters of hypnosis or suggestion and by this silence guard its existence. Their perspective on human behavior and governance is mechanistic. To understand them, we must pay closer attention to their reverence for simplified Pavlovian principles. In the latter part of the 19th century the Russian Nobel Prize winner Ivan Petrovich Pavlov conducted his famous experiments with a bell and a dog. He knew that salivation is associated with eating, and that if a dog was hungry, its mouth would water each time it saw food. Pavlov took advantage of this useful inborn reflex, which serves the digestive process, to develop in his experimental animal the salivating response in answer to a stimulus which would not ordinarily create it. Each time Pavlov fed the dog, he rang a bell, and at each feeding the dog's mouth watered. Then after many repetitions of the combined food bell stimulus, Pavlov rang the bell but did not feed the dog. The animal reacted to the bell alone just as it had previously reacted to the sight of food its mouth watered. Thus the scientist had found out that the dog could be induced to salivate involuntarily in response to an arbitrary signal. It had been conditioned to respond to the ringing of the bell as if that sound were the smell and taste of food. During each feeding session, Pavlov rang a bell causing the dog to salivate. After numerous repetitions of this paired food bell stimulus, Pavlov rang the bell without providing food. Remarkably, the dog responded to the bell alone by salivating, just as it had previously responded to the sight of food. Thus, Pavlov demonstrated that the dog could be conditioned to involuntarily salivate in response to an arbitrary signal. The animal had been conditioned to associate the ringing of the bell with the smell and taste of food. Based on this and similar experiments, Pavlov formulated his theory of conditioned reflexes, which describes learning and training as the gradual formation of a mosaic of conditioned responses. Each response is built upon the association between different stimuli. The more intricate the learned behaviors, also known as patterns, the greater the number of conditioned reflexes formed. As humans possess the most significant capacity for learning among all animals, they also exhibit the highest potential for complex conditioning. Pavlov's experiments held significant value for understanding both animal and human behavior, as well as the development of neurotic symptoms. However, the comprehension of these mechanisms within the human mind can be wielded for either beneficial or detrimental purposes, like any other form of knowledge. Regrettably, totalitarians have leveraged their understanding of psychological principles to serve their own agenda. They have employed certain Pavlovian discoveries in a nuanced and intricate manner, sometimes resorting to grotesque methods, to induce mental and political conditioning and subjugation in the individuals under their control, akin to human guinea pigs. Various organizations have existed with the aim of applying Pavlov's theoretical framework to reduce all human emotions to a fundamental, mechanistic structure of conditioned reflexes. Their political objective is to condition and shape the human psyche to adhere strictly to a narrow totalitarian worldview. This is achieved through two means, frequent repetition of its simplification and deliberate withholding of any alternative interpretations of reality. If you scrutinize any complex task you undertake throughout a typical day, such as driving a car, you'll notice that it often unfolds without conscious oversight. However, before these actions could become automatic, they were initially consciously learned and controlled with a specific goal in mind. 
you weren't inherently born with the reflex to quickly slam on the brakes in an emergency. Instead, you had to acquire this skill through learning, and with practice, this response eventually became second nature. Pavlov's exploration into the workings of the mind revealed how all animals, including humans, adapt to existing constraints by associating life's cues and signals with bodily reactions. The mind establishes connections between recurring simultaneous events, and the body responds to these established associations. All conditioned reflexes represent involuntary, transient adaptations to external pressures, establishing a perceived link between stimuli that may be unrelated. Another way to characterize the conditioned reflex is as a specific response of the mind-body system to a particular stimulus. We must recognize that conditioning occurs continuously throughout our lives, manifesting in both subtle and overt ways. We come to realize that the shaping of our personalities can occur through myriad means. Pavlov made another notable finding. The conditioned reflex could be most readily cultivated in a calm laboratory environment with minimal distractions. This principle is well known to animal trainers, who understand that isolating the subject and repetitively presenting stimuli are essential steps in domesticating wild animals. Pavlov established a fundamental principle from his research, indicating that the pace of learning is directly linked to tranquility and seclusion. Totalitarians have adhered to this principle, recognizing that they can condition their political targets most efficiently when kept isolated. In the totalitarian method of thought manipulation, the same isolation imposed on individuals is also enforced on groups of people. This explains why civilian populations in totalitarian states are restricted from unrestricted travel and shielded from ideological and political influences. Pavlov also discovered that certain animals exhibited faster learning when rewarded for displaying the correct response every time, while others learned more rapidly when the consequence of not learning was a painful stimulus. In human terms, the latter group of animals could be characterized as learning to evade punishment. This underscores the necessity of finding pleasure in the adversity encountered during the pursuit of human freedom. For instance, embracing laughter as a means of transforming negativity into positivity, thereby reframing the painful stimuli. For certain individuals, the approach of reward and praise serves as a catalyst for learning, while pain triggers resistance and defiance. Conversely, in others, the prospect of retribution and punishment for failure can effectively mold them into the desired behavioral pattern. Before executing their task proficiently, the brainwasher must discern which category their subject falls into. Some individuals are more susceptible to brainwashing than others, with part of their responsiveness potentially stemming from innate traits or previous conditioning towards conformity. Pavlov also differentiated between two forms of involuntary learning a weaker type where the learned response dissipated as soon as disruptions emerged, and a stronger type where the training persisted despite various altered circumstances. For our purposes, it's crucial to understand that there are individuals who easily lose their conditioned learning, while others, often referred to as the stronger types, maintain it. Pavlov also demonstrated the interaction between internal and external factors during the conditioning process. For instance, when a new laboratory assistant was introduced to work with the animals, their emotional responses to the newcomer could inhibit all of their recently acquired patterns. Pavlov attributed this phenomenon to the animal's investigatory reflexes, which he described as disruptive reactions. Modern psychology often interprets this phenomenon as a consequence of the altered emotional connection between the animal and its handlers. From this more contemporary perspective, we can readily extend the implications into the realm of human relations. Similar dynamics are evident in psychotherapy, where the establishment of an emotional connection between therapist and patient is paramount for successful treatment. While rapport can be established swiftly in certain instances, in others it may not develop at all, with gradual progress being more typical during therapy. Psychologists can assess an individual's susceptibility to conditioning and suggestibility relatively easily often utilizing straightforward questionnaires developed by Pavlovian researchers to gauge a person's receptiveness and adaptability to suggestion and potential brainwashing. In Pavlovian psychology, human speech is categorized as a form of conditioned reflex activity. Pavlov made a distinction between stimuli of the first order, which directly condition both humans and animals, and stimuli of the second order, 
which possess weaker and more complex conditioning properties. In this secondary signaling system, verbal cues substitute the original physical sound stimuli. In a detailed analysis of speech reflexes authored by prominent Russian psychologist Dobogiev, we gain valuable insights into how speech patterns and word signals are employed for mass conditioning purposes, particularly through propaganda and indoctrination techniques. Human interaction with the external world, as well as with other individuals, is primarily influenced by secondary stimuli, namely speech symbols. Humans acquire the ability to think in words and the linguistic constructs provided to them, which progressively shape their entire perspective on life and the world. As Dobrogiv articulates, Language is the means of man's adaptation to his environment. We could restate this idea as follows. Humans' necessity for communication with others often complicates their connection with the external world, as language and speech, being the verbal instruments we employ, are subjective and prone to variation. Dobrogi further asserts, Speech manifestations represent conditioned reflex functions of the human brain. In simpler terms, we can say, those who control and shape the words and phrases we use, those who hold sway over the press and radio, wield influence over the mind. This is the essence of the Pavlovian method, mechanically reiterate your assumptions and suggestions, while minimizing avenues for dissent and opposition. This straightforward formula is employed in the political conditioning of the masses. It is also the underlying goal of certain public relations apparatuses, which aim to sway the public into supporting a particular political party. We witness this strategy through the utilization of colors in films, TV shows, and news broadcasts. Take note of the prevalence of the colors red and blue. Television and radio incessantly disseminate political suggestions and propaganda, leading individuals to feel compelled to watch and listen. Merely turning off these mediums in some instances can be viewed as suspicious in itself. In psychoanalytic terms, constant propagandistic noise reinforced by assertive verbal signals can increasingly compel individuals to align themselves with the influential noisemaker. The voice of Big Brother echoes within all the lesser siblings. Political conditioning should not be conflated with training, persuasion, or even indoctrination. It goes beyond that. It involves manipulation. It entails seizing control of both the most basic and the most intricate nervous patterns of human beings. It is a struggle for dominance over nerve cells, characterized by coercion and enforced conversion. Rather than conditioning individuals to objectively confront reality, the manipulator conditions them to adopt catchphrases, verbal cliches, slogans, formulas, and symbols. The Pavlovian approach in the totalitarian context entails imprinting prescribed reflexes onto a fragmented mind. The totalitarian regime seeks first to elicit the desired response from nerve cells, then to assert control over the individual, and ultimately to dominate the masses. The process begins with verbal conditioning and training, which involves associating the requisite stereotypes with either negative or positive stimuli, pain, or reward. The Pavlovian theory, when applied as a political tool to standardize thought processes, referred to as Gleichschalten, by the Nazis, forms the cornerstone of totalitarian regimes. Some psychiatric observations are noteworthy because they reveal that Pavlovian training can only be effectively employed under specific mental circumstances. To mold individuals into the desired mold, victims must reach a state where their vigilant consciousness and mental awareness are compromised. Freedom of discourse and open intellectual exchange impede conditioning. Instead, feelings of terror, fear, hopelessness, isolation, and being cornered must be cultivated. Brainwashing, also referred to as mind control, menticide, coercive persuasion, thought control, thought reform, and forced re-education, is the notion that specific psychological methods can modify or manipulate the human mind. It is purported to diminish an individual's capacity for critical or independent thinking, enabling the insertion of new, undesired thoughts and concepts, and altering their attitudes, values, and beliefs. Brainwashing, derived from the Chinese term, Qi now refers to an intricate process of systematic indoctrination, conversion, and self-accusation employed to transform non-followers into compliant adherents. The adversary understands that beneath the surface, human existence is marked by inherent contradictions. They exploit this understanding to undermine and disorient the individual undergoing brainwashing. 
the awareness that the human psyche is susceptible to influence, control, and manipulation predates the contemporary totalitarian notion of enforced indoctrination. Across history, humans have instinctively recognized the manipulability of the mind. Elaborate tactics have been devised to achieve this objective. To gain deeper insight into contemporary psychological torment, it's imperative to acknowledge that since ancient times, physical suffering was never solely intended to cause pain to the victim. While they might not have articulated their comprehension in sophisticated language, medieval judges and executioners were cognizant of the unique spiritual and psychological dynamics between the victim and the broader community. These very judges and executioners also recognized that their trials were designed not only to torment the accused, but even more so to torment the bystanders, who, though perhaps unaware, empathized with the victims. From a psychological standpoint, we can perceive this entire mechanism as a manipulation of human empathy and the common inclination to empathize with others. All knowledge possesses a dual nature, capable of being employed for either benevolent or malevolent purposes, and psychology is not exempt from this overarching principle. Psychology has introduced humanity to novel methods of torture and intrusion into the mind. Between 1936 and 1938, there was a growing global awareness of the considerable danger posed by organized psychological manipulation in political contexts, particularly exemplified by the Moscow Purge trials. It seemed inconceivable that committed Bolsheviks, who had dedicated their lives to the cause of revolution, could suddenly be portrayed as deceitful individuals. However, as each accused individual confessed and exhibited remorse, skepticism emerged with many perceiving it as a choreographed deception intended for non-communist nations. Soon, the truth became evident, the accused, once human beings, were systematically reduced to puppets. Their actions were orchestrated by hidden influences, underscoring the insidiousness of psychological coercion. Examples abound of steadfast revolutionaries transitioning into submissive individuals, burdened by self-accusations. Their puppeteers called the tune, manipulated their actions. When, from time to time, news came through showing how hard, rigid revolutionaries could be changed into meek, self-accusing sheep. The modern techniques of brainwashing and menticide, those perversions of psychology, can bring almost any man into submission and surrender. Many of the victims of thought control, brainwashing, and menticide that we have talked about were strong men whose minds and wills were broken and degraded. But although the totalitarians use their knowledge of the mind for vicious and unscrupulous purposes, our democratic society can and must use its knowledge to help man to grow, to guard his freedom, and to understand himself. Menticide is a term coined by Merlu, derived from mens, meaning the mind, and kidera, signifying to kill. Menticide represents an age-old offense against the human mind and soul, yet it has been restructured and systematized. It entails an organized method of psychological manipulation and legal distortion, enabling a powerful dictator to imprint his opportunistic ideologies onto the minds of those he intends to exploit and dismantle. Eventually, terrorized victims find themselves coerced into demonstrating absolute conformity to the dictator's desires. To dismantle the minds of individuals, the totalitarian requires widespread mental disorder and linguistic disarray as both render his opposition inert and diminish the morale of his adversaries, provided they are unaware of the dictator's true intentions. Subsequently, they can commence constructing their framework of conformity, aiming to ensnare the victim through the gradual induction of a hypnotic state. This can be accomplished through gradual yet persistent pressures designed to erode a person's mental resilience. Tactics such as humiliation, harsh and inhumane treatment, degradation, intimidation, hunger, and exposure to extreme cold have all been employed to weaken an individual's resolve and soften them. It is a widely acknowledged scientific observation that passive memory often retains information learned under hypnosis more effectively than that acquired in a state of wakeful awareness. Time, fear, and ongoing pressure are recognized factors in inducing a menticidal hypnosis. The conscious aspect of the personality becomes inactive, and the individual exists in a trance-like state, replaying the narrative imprinted in their mind by another. Fortunately, there is awareness that once the victim is removed from the manipulated environment, the panicked and hypnotic influence dissipates, 
allowing them to reawaken to reality. During the Second World War, in regions under Nazi occupation, the Gestapo employed manipulation tactics to coerce individuals into betraying their friends and reporting new victims for subsequent torture. Over time, people began to believe that it was safer to avoid contact with one another, effectively isolating themselves from any support network. Not only political and Pavlovian pressures have the potential to subjugate the human mind into servile submission. Various other human habits and behaviors also exert coercive influence. Drugs and their psychological counterparts, for instance, are capable of enslaving individuals. In Nazi-occupied territories, individuals would often experiment with narcotics to desensitize themselves to pain. However, the outcomes proved paradoxical. While narcotics can induce insensitivity to physical pain, their numbing effects concurrently render individuals more susceptible to mental pressure. This phenomenon mirrors contemporary society, where drugs may alleviate physical distress by reducing pain sensitivity, yet they simultaneously dull cognitive faculties. Even during that era, people recognized, as did the Nazis, that it was not solely physical agony that led to psychological breakdown, but rather the sustained degradation and mental torment. Sometimes, it is not the physical injuries themselves that prove fatal, but rather the amalgamation of fear and wounded dignity. Briefly touching on another aspect of this issue, our perilous societal reliance on different drugs exacerbates the problem of addiction, facilitating our descent into patterns of submission. An alcoholic, for instance, loses their mental fortitude when provided with a drink. This holds true for chronic users of sedatives or other medications. Dependency on alcohol or drugs can lead to chemical addiction, diminishing our resilience in challenging situations. While the ecstatic state varies for each individual who encounters it, the addict consistently describes the drug as transporting them to the elusive paradise they seek. It provides a sense of everlasting euphoria and unbounded elation, transcending the constraints of life and time. In the ecstatic state, individuals often align the universe with their own desires while simultaneously seeking communion with a higher order. However, the ecstatic state encompasses both positive and negative aspects. It can signify the mystic sense of unity with the universe experienced by a yogi, but it can also denote the chronic state of intoxication in a drunkard or the fervor of certain manic psychotic episodes. This feeling may reflect the heightened spiritual experience of a dedicated study group, yet it may also manifest in a lynch mob or riot. Ecstasy comes in various forms, including aesthetic ecstasy, mystic ecstasy, and unhealthy, toxic ecstasy. Throughout human consciousness, individuals have intermittently sought to alleviate the inherent tension between themselves and the external world. When the demand for mental acuity becomes overwhelming, when the world weighs too heavily and persistently, individuals may endeavor to immerse themselves in the depths of oblivion. Ecstasy, narcotic-induced slumber and the accompanying fantasies and moments of mental elevation momentarily transport them beyond the taxing effort of maintaining alertness and ego integrity. Drugs can induce this state, and any addiction may be attributed to an ongoing desire to escape. The body collaborates with the mind in this quest for evasion from life, gradually transforming drugs into a physiological necessity, as well as an emotional crutch. Within criminal networks, Addictive substances such as cocaine and heroin are frequently administered to gang members to render them more compliant to the leader who dispenses them. The individual supplying the drugs assumes an almost godlike status among the gang members, who are willing to endure immense hardship to obtain the drugs they desperately crave. In the hands of a tyrant, the manipulation towards dependency can pose significant danger. It is not beyond reason to consider that a malevolent dictator may seek to exploit addiction as a tactic to subjugate a rebellious populace. During the occupation of Western Europe, a deliberate scarcity of essential medications was engineered by ceasing their usual export to the inferior countries. However, an exception was made for barbiturates. For instance, in Holland, these drugs were easily accessible in numerous drug stores without the need for doctor's prescriptions contrary to customary Dutch regulations. While therapeutic medications were withheld, drugs that induced passivity, dependency, and lethargy were distributed extensively. The totalitarian understands that drugs can serve as allies. Where slavery and submission to drugs and alcohol reign, 
democracy and freedom come to an end. Democracy entails unrestricted, self-elected engagement and comprehension. It signifies mature self-discipline and autonomy. Any individual who seeks refuge from reality through alcohol and drugs forfeits their status as a free agent. They lose the capacity for voluntary control over their mind and actions. They cease to be accountable for themselves. Alcoholism and drug addiction lay the groundwork for the mental subjugation favored by totalitarian indoctrination. Throughout history, individuals seeking insight into the inner workings of others' minds for the purpose of exerting pressure have employed artificial means to uncover the hidden pathways to their most intimate thoughts. Similarly, modern brainwashers have experimented with various drugs to achieve their nefarious objectives. Primitive medicine practitioners employed several methods to compel their victims to relinquish self-control and inhibition. Alcoholic beverages, toxic concoctions, or the inhalation of holy smoke with narcotic properties, as practiced by civilizations like the Mayans, were utilized to induce a state of euphoria where individuals lost self-awareness and restraint. In this state, victims often divulge self-incriminating fantasies or their deepest secrets, while murmuring sacred words. During the Middle Ages, substances known as witch ointments were utilized either voluntarily or under coercion. These ointments purportedly facilitated contact with the devil, as they contained significant amounts of opiates and belladonna, which could have been absorbed through the skin. Modern science attributes the ecstatic visions they induce to the hallucinogenic properties of these drugs. Among the earliest valuable tools bestowed upon spiritual healers by medicine was the understanding of hypnosis, an intensified form of mental suggestion that compels individuals to relinquish their own will and fosters a peculiar dependence on the hypnotist. Egyptian physicians from 3,000 years ago were versed in the practice of hypnosis, as evidenced by ancient records. With persistence and skill, the hypnotist can achieve their goal. Within every individual lie numerous latent antisocial desires. Skillful application of hypnotic techniques can unearth these desires, prompting their manifestation in reality. While suggestion and hypnosis are viewed as psychological blessings by some, they also harbor the potential for terror. Mass hypnosis, for instance, can exert a perilous sway over individuals. Psychiatrists have observed on numerous occasions that public exhibitions of mass hypnosis may trigger heightened hypnotic reliance and subservience in many audience members, with effects enduring for years. Hypnosis can serve as a catalyst for awakening repressed dependency needs in the subject, temporarily transforming them into a form of conscious sleepwalker and mental subordinate. Under hypnotic influence, the individual sheds much of their personal responsibility relinquishing a significant portion of their conscience to the hypnotist. Certain individuals are more susceptible to hypnosis than others. Robust egos may resist mental intrusion for a prolonged duration, yet they too have a threshold of susceptibility. Some individuals are overly critical and are less responsive to external suggestions than to internal imagery. We can categorize personalities as either heterosuggestive or autosuggestive although a range of responses to hypnosis and suggestion exists. Nevertheless, even autosuggestive individuals, when subjected to sufficient pressure, may gradually develop internal rationalizations for succumbing to mental coercion. There is a lack of distinct awareness between the self, the individual, and the external world. Such fear-stricken individuals experience perpetual anguish, as they perceive themselves as the targets of numerous inexplicable influences beyond their control or comprehension, consistently feeling threatened. Psychologically, their apprehension of external intrusion may partly stem from a fear of their own internal fantasies emerging from the depths of their unconscious. They are apprehensive of their concealed, unconscious thoughts, which they are unable to monitor or regulate. Throughout the early 1950s and spanning two decades, the Central Intelligence Agency, CIA, and the Department of Defense, DOD, in the United States undertook clandestine investigations, notably Project MKUltra, with the aim of devising effective brainwashing methodologies. The complete outcomes remain undisclosed, as a significant portion of the documentation was deliberately eliminated to conceal from the public the activities conducted with taxpayer funds. Director Sidney Gottlieb and his team purportedly possessed the capability to erase the existing consciousness of an individual through the implementation of torture methods. 
Subsequently, they endeavored to introduce a new consciousness into the resultant void, a process akin to reprogramming. CIA MKUltra Doc 190684 Hypnosis as a Weapon of Controlling People states. In a general request for volunteers redacted volunteered for H experimentation and were originally tested on the 21st of May 1951. Both girls were, at this time, 19 years of age. On the 9th of January 1952, in a group of volunteers redacted was initially tested in the H techniques along with a group of volunteers. Redacted at this time, was 20 years of age. In each instance, all volunteers on the initial contact were given a brief discussion of age, were given a very general picture of security's interest in the work and were given a very painted lecture on the necessary security essential to these operations. In each instance, after the above explanations had been made, all subjects were tested in the following manner, a. Falling back test b. Hand and arm levitation test c. General relaxation procedure with explanation. It should be noted that redacted on their initial tests, responded successfully to the falling back and levitation tests, but the relaxation or sleep induction tests were not overly successful. However, since both girls were intelligent and cooperative they were, at that point, regarded as very good material. The same more or less applied to redacted who did not appear particularly suggestible to the above-mentioned tests, but since she had shown interest she was regarded at this point as being a good future subject. For matter of regard, in all three cases on the second effort at induction each subject succeeded in obtaining a very deep H state, and thereafter and up to the present time, the girls have been exceptionally splendid subjects. All of the individuals have been given numerous tests from simple post-H to very complex activities and have performed in what we believe to be a highly indicative manner. The writer and redacted have never felt that we could determine by experimentation what actually could be done with the H technique under field operating conditions with life and death element at stake. However, the writer and redacted do firmly believe that from a physical point of view, a great deal can be determined what individuals can do under H. In addition, under H they have moved all over the building, passed guards, engaged in conversation, taken polygraph tests, written, drawn fully under H and have total amnesia for these activities. Furthermore, in these cases, when work has been expanded for a considerable period of time, all commands have been carried on in a matter of a few seconds although H was not diseased or in any way brought to the attention of the subjects for the periods existing over months at a time. Recently, in view of the broadened approach to the problem and also in view of the fact that we have lost the services of redacted we carried out experiments involving considerable area in and around Washington. These experiments clearly demonstrated to a certain extent that individuals under H can move about, travel and act normal over a certain amount of time and space and may possibly have a bearing on more advanced experimentation which this office wishes to undertake in the future. In this connection, this office expects a report from Redacted our professional H consultant from Redacted in the near future. This report should cover Redacted checks on certain very pertinent matters concerning very advanced uses of H. The report will be available for all interested parties upon completion. Since these subjects have been actively engaged in this work for some time, as mentioned above, taken part in a great many difficult tests and experiments, but basically the efforts of the writer and redacted were turned toward producing a normal type of activity while under H, and also how could H be obtained on an individual via the telephone, or very subtle methods without the person's immediate associates realizing that H control had been obtained. In all of these cases, these subjects have clearly demonstrated that they can pass from a fully awake state to a deep H-controlled state via the telephone via some very subtle signal that cannot be detected by other persons in the room and without the other individual being able to note the change. It has been shown clearly that physically individuals can be induced into H by telephone, by receiving written matter or by the use of code, signals, or words and that control of those hypnotized can be passed from one individual to another without great difficulty. It has also been shown by experimentation with these girls that they can act as unwilling couriers for information purposes and that they can be conditioned to a point where they can believe a change in identity on their part, even on the polygraph. Whether or not it could be used as a challenge to the polygraph cannot be stated by the writer and redacted since we are lacking statistical information, but, in certain instances, 
it has been clearly shown that H can materially affect polygraph readings. Further experimentation along these lines is contemplated. All of the above will show that certain normal individuals are capable of very deep H and can carry out activities which may be of value from the artichoke point of view. Our tests, which now number in the thousands with dozens of subjects, while strongly indicative, are not, in our opinion, complex enough or carried out under hazardous conditions to warrant extravagant claims for operational use. They do, however, indicate that it has a potentiality as a weapon either as an information-gaining aspect or as an operational weapon. Recent scientific literature concerning the mental disorder. Dissociative Identity Disorder DID discusses the deliberate use of torture-based brainwashing by malicious actors as a method to induce the development of multiple, programmable, personalities within an individual. This manipulation aims to exploit the individual for various purposes. In his 2000 publication, Destroying the World to Save It, Aum Shinrikyo, Apocalyptic Violence, and the New Global Terrorism, Robert Lifton highlighted that Western governments, in their endeavors to combat terrorism, were reportedly employing certain purported mind control methods. Which may I add, according to ex-U.S. psychological warfare officer Scott Bennett, Western powers are using 911 trauma-based mind control on the public. Human beings frequently persist beyond their endurance thresholds because they maintain a belief that their tormentors possess some inherent morality, hoping that these oppressors will eventually grasp the magnitude of their crimes and cease their actions. However, this belief is a misconception. The most effective approach to fortifying one's defenses against an orchestrated assault on the mind and will is to gain a deeper understanding of the adversary's objectives and to outsmart them. Every individual possesses their unique threshold of endurance, a point that can often be reached and even exceeded, as evidenced clinically. No one can accurately foresee how they will manage a situation when faced with a challenging test. Over time, we have grown to discern public recantations as mere propaganda ploys. Now, we are increasingly realizing the blatant use of menticide by totalitarians, purposefully, overtly, without shame, as an integral aspect of their official political policy to solidify and uphold their authority. Naturally, they present a different narrative, portraying it as confessions of genuine and treasonous offenses. Ultimately, human resistance and disagreement cannot be extinguished. They linger, ready to stir at the slightest hint of freedom. The notion that alternative paths to truth exist beyond immediate perception resides within each individual. While one may restrict avenues of exploration and expression, the belief in uncharted and daring pathways persists in the depths of the human psyche. The human is not a collection of autonomous components like a machine. Rather, it is an integrated entity where the mind and body interact reciprocally, influencing the external environment and being influenced by it.